good day and Merry Christmas. We're now well into the 12 days of Christmas, starting on Christmas Day and ending on the most festive day of the holiday season, Twelfth Night. In our modern world, we see Christmas as the culmination of the holiday season. That's when we receive presents, we have parties, we see family and friends. In the 18th century though, Christmas Day was a more solemn occasion and many of the festive elements that we enjoy today were actually celebrated on Twelfth Night. The difference between Christmas Day and Twelfth Night is seen in one record, one beautiful journal entry done by James Boswell in 1762. Now on Christmas Day, he does not record much that was going on besides for going to church. But on Twelfth Night, he says, this was Twelfth Day, on which a great deal of jollity goes on in England at the eating of the Twelfth Cake all sugared over. I took a whim that between St. Paul's and the Exchange and back again, taking the different sides of the street, I would eat a penny Twelfth Cake at every shop where I could get it. This I performed faithfully. Now. James talks about what he was able to purchase when he was visiting in England. And he also comments later on in his journal that he regrets that he was not able to celebrate Twelfth Night at a private home. He unfortunately did not know anyone well enough to be invited to a private affair. So he did the next best thing and went around buying every piece of Twelfth Night cake he could find. Boswell also shows how important the cake was to the celebrations. In the 18th century, you could purchase the cake already made, you could make it or you could make it at home. And we have many receipt books, both professionally published, but also private accounts written by women that have receipts or recipes for different types of cakes that could have been used as a Twelfth Night cake. Unfortunately, the earliest written recipe that we have for an actual Twelfth Night Cake, labeled Twelfth Night Cake, is from John Mollard in 1803. That being said, we do know that Twelfth Night Cakes were enjoyed and celebrated well before the 18th century. And you can see what was probably used for a Twelfth Night Cake in many of these receipt books. They might not be labeled that though. We see everything from Alita Bagart's uh, personal account book in 1811, calling it a wedding cake, or in the ladies' closet companion, a plum cake. And again, probably the most common is a rich cake or a great cake. And you see that in The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy by Hannah Glass. In a private home, you could make your own cake yourself, again, using these receipts, either those that were handed down by other family members or adapted from professional books. In the Schuyler family, though, it's very important to note that this cake would have been made by enslaved cooks that were enslaved by the Schuyler family. This cake could have been made by Susanna, Bette, Silva, or other enslaved cooks who were trained and able to do this, but again, we're doing this for the Schuyler family, not themselves. The cake we'll be making today is an adapted version. A lot of these receipts have descriptions of huge quantities that honestly, we really don't need today, especially this year. We're probably all going to be celebrating in a smaller capacity in our own homes with just our immediate families. So we don't need a recipe that includes 30 eggs or three pounds of flour. So today we're looking at an adapted recipe from Martha Washington's own private collection. And again, that was her own account that she kept down, a receipt that she appreciated. And Mount Vernon has made a modified version of that receipt that you can do in your own kitchen today. All of these receipts have something in common. And again, this is part of the reason why the word plum cake might have been popular. Plum isn't, in, in this case, 
isn't a reference to the fruit itself. It's actually describing dr various dried fruits. So there are different receipts that have raisins or candied peels of different types. So we have an orange peel or a lemon peel. And finally, probably the most popular that I've seen are currants. And you can see these are wonderful. And there's many receipts that talk about making sure you pit the currants, make sure you clean them, make sure there aren't any stems in them. So this was something that was popular and a specialty for the holiday season. First, what you wanna do is you wanna take whichever plum or dried fruit you choose and you're going to be adding that, adding alcohol to them. This is a brandy, but you can also use Madeira. So we have first about a cup of dried fruit and at least for 24 hours, you want to soak them in brandy or Madeira or a combination of both, the alcohol of your choice. And again, if you're doing this for younger family members, you can definitely exclude the alcohol, although it does give a wonderful flavoring, almost like um, an, an extract. Once you've let all of those ingredients soak, you can begin the actual process of baking. In the 18th century, to prepare for baking, you would have used a cake hoop like this. And this is literally just a cylinder and you can see it has no bottom. So you would wrap that cake hoop with parchment paper and then tie it together and finally use a cookie sheet, something like just a piece of tin. And that's how you would have baked your cake. This is a small cake hoop and for today you can use a springform pan about eight inches across, but there are descriptions of some of these cakes being absolutely huge and beautiful illustrations of people carrying in the Twelfth Night cake, two men carrying this ginormous cake in into the table. So after you have soaked your fruit, you want to grease and flour whatever cake pan you're using. Next, you'll be using three cups, not three pounds, three cups of flour sifted. Again, in the 18th century, you would have had something like this horsehair mesh sifter to be able to do that. And they also say in the receipts to, do, to sift through your fruit as well. Again, making sure that you're catching any impurities out of it. For spices, you can really select the spices you like and you do see a different degree depending on the receipt that you use. The most common and the one that we're using for this recipe or the two we're using for this recipe, the nutmeg. So a half a teaspoon of gr freshly ground nutmeg. I'll be honest, I use a whole uh, teaspoon. Just gives it a little bit more of a kick and you can use uh, powdered uh, nutmeg or again you can grate it yourself and then a little bit more interesting mace and mace was a very popular ingredient you don't see it as much in modern recipes today but what mace is is actually kind of a webbing or an outer coating that went on the outside of the nutmeg so again if you get dried mace you're going to have to grind this yourself or you can purchase it powdered in your grocery store. You'll sift all of those together and then put your flour and spices aside. In the 18th century, obviously we couldn't just go to the grocery store. All of this would have been very labor intensive. You would have had someone, again, in the Schuyler household, this would have been someone who was enslaved, doing a lot of the labor to prepare all of these ingredients. So it's something that we often take for granted how much time and effort went into this when today we have the convenience of a lot of electronic devices or again, pre-processed ingredients for our baking. Next, speaking of difficulty, you're going to take three quarters of a cup of softened butter. Now with an electric mixer, you can actually um, 
uh, make sure this is whipped nicely make sure it's very light you'll notice throughout this recipe we're doing a lot of things to bring as much air into the cake as possible because at this time period you don't have chemical leaven leavening uh, agents so your leavening agent is a whisk so getting your butter nice and soft getting it whipped to that three quarters cup butter you'll add a cup and a half of sugar again whipping it all the time you want it as light and frothy as possible next three eggs and you're going to take these eggs and separate them the yolks you're going to again whip up as light and fluffy as possible add that to your butter and sugar mixture make sure that's all uh, set aside and then for the egg whites you're going to whip those until you uh, create firm peaks. So again, adding as much air as possible. This does not take a lot of time today, but you can imagine if you're doing this and it's really your own labor and this device, it's going to take a long time to be able to get to that point. Once you have all of your processed ingredients, you're going to start slowly adding them together. First, you take your spiced flour and your butter and sugar and start slowly mixing them in. Then you take that alcohol that your plums or dried fruit had been soaking in, you take that and pour that in, again, mixing everything together. The last thing on this stage of the process you're going to add are the egg whites and those you're going to gently fold in. You wanna try and trap as much of that air into the batter as you possibly can. So you're going to gently fold that into your dough. Finally, once everything is together, you're going to take those wonderful dried fruits, again, your choice, um, either if you go with a mixture or if you decide that you just really love candied lemon peel like I do, you might wanna just choose one or two. Add those in and then finally, about a half a cup of slivered almonds. I'll be honest, I'm not a huge fan of slivered almonds, so I always forget to add these, kind of on purpose, on accident. Once all of your ingredients are mixed, pour them into that prepared cake pan, whether or not you're doing a traditional cake, cake hoop or you do, you're doing a spring form plant pan. The most important ingredient to this whole process, which again, something I, for some reason, always forget, you have to add the bean. Now this bean, and I've seen accounts of both a bean and a pea, whichever, or maybe a coin. This is how the king or queen of Twelfth Night is decided. And there are wonderful accounts of children being the ones who provide each visitor with their piece of cake because children are much more trustworthy than the adults and they will hopefully not cheat. But whoever finds this uncooked bean and hopefully doesn't swallow it or break a tooth gets to be the king or queen for the evening. They might be the ones that get to assign roles for the night. They might be able to make rules or they just get to celebrate and be uh, in charge for the evening. You're going to want to bake this cake in a moderate oven, which in our temperatures today, it's about 325 degrees. This will be baked for about three hours. I'll be honest, I often do a little bit less than three hours. So you wanna keep an eye on it and test it. Once that cake is solid in the middle, it should be done. Now your final product, if everything works out well, is a beautiful 12th night cake, not burnt, that is chock full of these wonderful candied fruits, dried fruits, also that brandy. So again, this is a celebratory cake and you can leave it as is if you like. But in the 18th century, we have wonderful accounts of beautiful decorations that were applied to the cake to really celebrate the night. So I hope you enjoy your 12th night this year, even if it's at home, and I hope that everyone has a wonderful holiday season.